What's going on everybody? In this episode, we're gonna be talking about nested data in GraphQL. Absolutely love this stuff. This is what makes GraphQL awesome because we can choose what nested data we want returned and if we want any properties returned from that data. Now the cool part is, we don't care how this is set up in the back end. Regardless of what back end you use, the way you query this in GraphQL is going to be the same. And the data could be coming from multiple tables with joins, or it could be coming from two completely different databases and the information's federated together. Doesn't really matter. The way we're gonna be doing it in this video is with multiple tables in a relational database. Some of you watching, I'm sure you are trying to do this with a NoSQL database, and that's going to probably make your application code a lot simpler because you're not going to have to deal with migrations and relationships and foreign keys and blah, ugh. But that's what we're doing in this video. So we're going to learn all the necessary steps to deal with relational data in our backend. Now, if you need the full crash course on structured databases, I do have a database design series I made back when I was like 12. So OG stuff, check it out. So an example of what we might wanna do is get a list of customer data, but also get any orders for those individual customers. Using nested data, we can make one request to the backend and get all the information at once, which is usually a nice setup for a single page application because you're not going to have to make multiple network requests and your application will be very quick. Now, there might be a little bit extra effort on the database side gathering all that data for you, but it'll reduce network traffic from the front end making requests to the back end. This structure is an alternative setup to having an API endpoint to get all the customers and then an API endpoint to get all of the orders for an individual customer, which would then be invoked on the fly whenever you want customer order data. Now you could do the nested data with a traditional REST API, you know, build out that structure on the back end and send it as a single JSON response. So it's not wildly different, but GraphQL does give us the ability to choose which relationships we want returned and what properties on the nested data that we want returned as well. So it's probably good to be familiar with both. So let's just get started by first taking a peek at what the functionality is supposed to be like with an already existing GraphQL endpoint. So we've taken a peek at the SpaceX GraphQL endpoint before, and you can imagine for this nested data, this could be structured across multiple tables with foreign keys pointing back to the main entity. So we want to replicate some of this behavior where you can decide if you want nested data or not returned. For us right now, all we have is the ability to get customers, but we're not getting any nested data. So the very first thing we need to do is actually create some kind of nested data, which will basically be data relating back to an individual customer. The example I have is customer orders. So we're going to make an orders table and each one of the orders is going to be owned or assigned a customer. So to do this, we're going to jump into our backend code, specifically in our models, and we're going to define a new class here, whatever you want to be related to customers. In our case, it's going to be orders. So we'll say order singular, and this will also inherit from models.model. Now we're going to define the fields. Let's first start with the foreign key because we don't want to forget that. For reference, we'll take a peek at the documentation. And here is an example of an article that depends on a reporter. So you'll say what the thing is called and then say models.foreignKey passing in that class and an on delete, which in this case is models.cascade. What this section here defines is what happens to an article if the parent reporter is removed. So if we delete the reporter from the database, Cascade is going to send that same command down to the article and delete it as well. Fairly risky because you know you could delete one thing and see it cascade through your entire database, but it is quite common and does make sense to keep your database clean. There are a bunch of other options, so you can see some of them here. We have Cascade, Protect will prevent deletion, and there's Restrict. There's another popular one, which is set null, which will make it an orphan. Set default will replace it to something else or give it a new parent. And if you have a hard time understanding what some of these mean, there's a good question on Stack Overflow. What does on delete do on Django models? And the answer gives really good English examples that describe what each thing does. So take a moment and read through these. So for example, set null is like saying, all right, if I'm not yours, then I'm nobody's. And you're not gonna have a value 
pointing to the parent. Set default is going to replace that value with something else. Now, an important thing to note here is that Django has its own implementation on top of SQL and that these constraints are not actually created on the database. So Django will emulate this behavior, which you can see the documentation say that here emulating the behavior of SQL constraints. So as you'll see, when we create our model, we will be able to check the SQL that's being generated and there will not be an on delete cascade defined in it. So let's talk now about how we can finish off this order. We will have a customer and this is going to be from models.foreignKey, passing in the customer class and on delete models.cascade. Perfect, now we can put any other attributes you might want for an order. We're gonna keep this very simple but you can take these principles to build upon them for more complex examples. So we might have a description, which could come from models dot char field with a max length of, let's say 500, you know, give them some space to write if they need to describe what's going on and maybe a total value. So we'll just call it total in sense because I don't really want to use any floating numbers here. Django does have models.decimal. However, with SQLite 3, the current database I'm using, there is no decimal type. So this is just a more foolproof way to not have to worry about any kind of floating point issues. And then basically you can just divide it by 100 to get whatever dollar value. So we will make this total in sense be models.integer field, and that's going to prevent any kind of potential issues with floating point. So that should be good. And now that we have these fields, we can turn this into a table by creating a migration. So Python manage py make migrations. And you can see it created this 0002 order, which you can find in our files here, which will check into version control. And you can click it and see what's in it, but this isn't the SQL that's sent to the database. This is some Django specific stuff you're not going to have to worry about, but if you want to see the actual SQL, you can say Python manage py SQL migrate, pass in the app name customers, and then the number of the migration 0002, and this will show you the SQL. Now you can see the foreign key customer ID, big int, not null, references customers customer ID. However, it says nothing about cascade or what happens for the referential integrity. So again, that's all done in the software side in Django, which is probably fine, but just keep in mind, if you are going to use this database for another application, that those integrity rules are not defined in the database. Cool, so at this point, we got the migration. Now we need to apply this SQL to our database with Python manage py migrate and it will apply the migrations. So we got the database table. Now we just have to put data inside of it. We can do this in a few ways. You could, you know, create the front end application, but it's jumping a little bit far because I really want to make sure the database is all set up good before we start building the front end. You could put the data in interactively in the Python terminal, which is a pretty good step. I've done this in other Django videos, probably on my YouTube channel or in my course, or alternatively, you can add it to the admin site and then type in the data manually using the CRUD capabilities there, which is what I'm going to recommend. So we set up the admin site earlier on in the series, but if you're just jumping in, you'll want to create an admin.py file inside of your app. Now inside of admin.py, we will just say admin.site.register and pass in our new model, which was called order. And we will import this. So from, actually we can just keep it on the same line. So import customer and order. Perfect. Now let's go ahead and start our server. Python manage py run server. And now let's take a look at our backend localhost 8000 admin log in with your super user and you'll see your customers app with the two tables. We have customers and orders. You want to make sure you have at least one customer in here. I actually cleared out the data just because there was a bunch of junk in there. So let's go ahead and add a new customer. And let's say we have a customer, John Smith, and he works in the restaurant industry. What we'll do is go ahead and save. Now he has the ID of one, so we can go over to the orders and we can add an order, choose the customer, customer object one. We can change this display by heading over to our models and adding a stir method here. So it'll look like this, underscore, underscore, stir. And this is going to be a function. So we'll say def stir. And this will also have self defined here, which is how you create an instance method. And we'll just return a string such as self.name. 
Now taking a look at our site, do a quick refresh. You can see our customer now shows up as John Smith. Description of the work. Let's just say we're some kind of contractor or something and we did some electrical work. Installed some circuits. Total in cents. We charged them 300 bucks, so 300 times 100, so 30,000. Let's go ahead and save. And we could also change the display for the orders as well if you wish. So let's go ahead and try that. We'll say def stir passing in self and return self.description. And that'll just show a quick description on this preview page, which might be a little bit more organized. Let's go ahead and add another order for the same guy. So John Smith description, replaced some lights. Total in cents, $252.55. Save, perfect. Now what I wanna do is be able to go to GraphQL and make a request for not only the customer for their ID and their name and industry, but I also want to be able to get any orders that they have done with me. Now taking a peek at the graphene docs, they have something pretty similar where they have a category and an ingredient where this is a many to one relationship where ingredient has the category defined here as a foreign key. So very similar setup. So we can scroll through here and figure out exactly how they did it. So we will create a new class inheriting from Django object type as we did earlier, add a field to our query and create the resolve function. So let's head over to schema.py to find a new class here. So this is going to be class order type and this will inherit from Django object type and this will have class meta with the model being order which we will import and we'll just take all of the fields which is the easiest way to do this so underscore underscore all underscore underscore so far so good now let's head down to query we will add one here so this is going to be orders and this will come from graphene list and this will be of type order type now let's create the resolve function def resolve orders passing in root info and in here it's going to be very similar to resolve customers we'll say return order dot objects dot all is that what we want uh close but not quite we're actually going to do objects dot select related and pass in the field customer and then dot all so it'll look like this instead. So save and let's try this out. So when you're on this site, you can now see in the query that we have the ability to get orders in addition to customers and you can see all the fields on that. And taking a look at customers, there's this new field order set. So if we wanna actually get the orders, we don't use the keyword orders as you would assume. This is actually going to give us a problem and you can see hovering over, cannot query field orders on type customer type. Did you mean order set? So what's going on here is that by default, Django has a reverse relationship on the parent translation. Not only can you get the customer from an order, but you can also get all of the orders for a specific customer. The way you do that is with the field called order set in this case. So let's just try it out and then we'll talk about how to actually rename it. So we'll say order set and we'll get the ID and let's go ahead and take a look at the order type to see what it expects. So ID, description, and total in cents. Cool, let's run this. And now we got a pretty good structure where we have customers. ID one, John Smith, who has two orders, ID 192, and here are the orders and the total in cents. You don't have to use cents. I mean, you could do dollars, it'd be fine. I just, but that's off topic. That's not what I wanna talk about. How do we change a name to orders is the question. Well, when you define a foreign key in your models right here, you have the ability to pass in another argument. And that argument is called related name. So we can assign it a string of what we would want this stuff to show up as inside of this stuff. So we want our orders to show up inside of customer as orders. 
which now everything should be good. This doesn't actually change the structure in the database. It just changes our backend code, changing what field you're going to use on the customer to access the orders for that customer. So let's try it out over here. Now we can change order set and we might need to do a refresh just to get the proper syntax highlighting. So now we should be able to say order plural hitting run and there we go that is how you do it now what we're going to do is we're going to add a new customer to see that we can get a full list of customers and their orders so let's go in here and add a customer let's say we work for someone named sal last name brown i don't know i can't think of any names and let's just say she is in the industry of construction sure save and let's go into orders and add a few orders for this lady and we'll go into add order customer Sal Brown description painting let's say we did some painting for this person and we charged six hundred and fifty dollars and fifty cents sure and we will save and add another and the second one is going to be something else let's say flooring and we charged two thousand dollars and if you're worried about, you know, typing in something incorrect because you're not used to this being in cents, you could change it to dollars or alternatively just design your front end to take in a dollar value and then just store it in cents in the database. This isn't something that the actual user of the application needs to know about. So we'll save that. And now back in our GraphQL endpoint, we can run and we get both customers with all of the different orders for that specific customer. So these are all the customers for John Smith and these are all the customers for Sal Brown. We should also be able to still get a customer by name. So we could switch this over to customer by name, passing in the name of say John Smith and this will just give us that individual customer back. And let's say we wanted this customer, but we didn't need to do all this extra order junk. Well, we could just get rid of it. Simple as that. And there you go. So that's a decent summary on how to set up nested data in GraphQL for the back end. Now in the front end, what we could do is we could build out so it lists the customers, but you either have the option of showing the individual customers orders right there in line on the page, or clicking on a customer to have that data show up. So for example, you could have a modal pop-up showing that extra information or send them to a new page. And you could pass the order information through props. We're going to experiment with some of this in the next episode, so definitely stay tuned if you want to see the front end part of this, where we will be consuming this endpoint and putting the orders into our application. Thanks so much for staying tuned. Also, thank you for being patient in this React series, going through all this backend stuff. But the reality is this is more of a full stack React series. That's what most web development is going to be like. And this is the best way to learn this material. So definitely appreciate it. And I definitely appreciate it if you subscribe. Thank you. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.